Okay, so does everyone see the ash throated flycatcher? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. Yeah. So we're, today we're going to talk about bird food um, and not uh, bird seed versus suet, but uh, basically the diet and bird behavior, uh, various bird behaviors uh, for, um, for quite a few species of birds. Uh, so let's see. So here's. Oh, yeah. And so I'm going to be choosing photos that go way back uh, from when I first started shooting, which was 2008, although there's not too many from that far back because I wasn't very accomplished when I started, or I wasn't accomplished at all. Um, but uh, I'm just choosing, you know, some of my favorite shots from back from the last 14 years. Uh, and I chose bird food because uh, I mostly enjoy shooting bird behavior. Um, birds doing things and have a little dynamic, uh, dynamic poses and uh, add a little life to the picture. And I find it more engaging for the audience generally. And rather than just do general bird behavior, I figured I'd focus it on bird food for this presentation. So here's a general idea of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I've kind of got it categorized, although it kind of crosses over sometimes, but uh, we're looking at uh, you know, food gathering, you know, so birds that eat seeds and berries. And then we're going to look at hunting, um, which is maybe a little bit more dramatic. Um, look at feeding young. And then a particular type of feeding called interspecific feeding, which we'll go into later. And cooperative feeding. We'll look at uh, one or two slides on birds playing with food, scavenging, uh, and then quite a few on uh, water birds that are, that, uh, they get their prey from, from water uh, and look at some courtship feeding. And then finally, we'll look at thievery with a few shots at the end from my friend, Ken Finisi. So here we go, food gathering. So, uh, so this here is a American goldfinch. Uh, oh yeah, I should say the title or the, excuse me, the species name is at the bottom right corner of each photo. And I might forget to mention it, some of these photos, so you can always see it. Or if you don't hear me well, you can, you can see what it is. So this is a small little bird that's found uh, well, all over the place. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a seed eater. So this is just kind of a cute photo of this uh, cute bird. And you can see the seeds dropping off this funny little seed pod. And uh, here's a lovely bird, a painted bunting. Uh, feeding on some uh, foxtail. He's got a little seed in his mouth. Uh, this was taken in Florida. It's a bird that's not found around here. And flowers are a tremendous source of food for various birds. Um, this olive-throated parakeet, which was taken in Belize, um, is picking the flowers and then uh, pulling out the seed and, and uh, leaving the, the petals to fall to the ground. And on the same tree, um, here's a hooded oriole. But instead of going after the seeds, it's, uh, it's, it's lapping up the nectar. Now back in the US, um, it's an Alice hummingbird. And the hummingbirds, of course, are the, the quintessential uh, flower, flower consuming birds. Uh, they feed on the nectar pr uh, predominantly uh, using that, uh, that, uh, that long tongue. And here's just a few nice uh, selection of some of my favorite hummingbird photos. This was taken in Colombia. It's a tourmaline sun angel. I think the flower is prettier than the bird, but so be it. And the, one of the most remarkable hummingbirds is the swordbill hummingbird. And uh, thank you to Vivek and Luis, uh, who provided the uh, the flash equipment for this uh, this trip we took down to uh, uh, to Ecuador? And this from the California desert down in Anza Borrego is a Costa's hummingbird feeding on Ocotillo. Um, this is the certainly the dominant flower down there, and whenever you find some <laughs> Ocotillos, which is all over the place, um, it's easy to uh, to find some birds nearby. And this is 
also a costless hummingbird on Ocotillo. This is a female, but I put this photo in not because it's a great photo, but uh, it, it uh, illustrates the, all the caked up pollen on the, on the forehead of this bird. Um, so we usually think of bees as pollinators, but uh, hummingbirds do a great job as well. And we'll see another bird later on that, uh, that uh, is performing a, the service of pollination. Now, another bird this is a verdant on, again, on Ocotillo, um, but unlike the hummingbird, which has a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship with the flower because it gets nectar and it pollinates the, pollinates the, uh, the flowers. And so it, uh, they both benefit. This verdant, I, you, I guess you'd refer to as a parasite because you can see it's biting into the base of the flower to extract the nectar. So he never touches the pollen. And so he just steals, steals what he wants and then, uh, and then takes off with the prize. Now, this is just a cute photo. This is again of a verdant, but this is a young bird that's just learning how to feed itself. So you can see it's grabbing a flower, but of course there's no nectar in that flower. It's all dried up, but you know, he's just learning. Um, and then a moment later, Things aren't going quite as he expected. Uh, and uh, it gets uh, from bad to worse. And uh, yeah, here he is a moment later, still just trying to figure things out. And so in terms of food gathering, berries are a huge source. And around here, um, there's lots of toy and berries and they're, they're a favorite food of quite a few species like this robin. And, uh, and also my favorite, the cedar waxwing. And uh, yeah, turkeys love it too. Something I just recently learned. Uh, so here he is in the middle of the bush, just uh, feasting. And let's see, oh yeah. And so yeah, here's a turkey that instead of just jumping into the bush, uh, like the other one did, he would leap up, grab a few berries, and then fall down to the earth with uh, two or three in his mouth. Quite a bit of effort for a little berry. And uh, this is a, a Chinese pistache tree. It's an ornamental that's you know, found all over the valley here. Um, and again, it's a favorite for various bird species. Um, this, this is a Western bluebird. And uh, a European starling, also on the Chinese pistache berries. So this particular group of berries is perfect because the birds, uh, from what I've seen, they always wait for the, for the berries to ripen a little bit. So you can see there's a lot of green berries here are partially green. And uh, I've never seen them eat red berries. Now for a bit of a larger fruit, uh, but a smaller bird uh, is this chestnut back chick chickadee. And persimmons are another favorite food for birds around here. Um, especially, you know, when, the, when a tree ripens, if it's got a lot of, berry, uh, a lot of fruit on it, um, you'll find quite a few species. I think I've photographed over two dozen species of birds feeding on persimmons. So it's, it's a fun way to spend some time if you find a, a, a tree with nice ripe persimmons. Uh, and here's a red-breasted sapsucker. And even the hummingbirds uh, get in on the action. Again, when the fruit ripens, uh, it becomes, there's a lot of like juicy liquid inside. And so the, uh, the hummingbirds can just uh, lap it up. And our favorite, the acorn woodpecker at a granary tree. So I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but just, um, just in case there's a few beginners there, the uh, acorn woodpeckers in the fall, they collect acorns and store them in the tree. And then throughout the winter, they, uh, they extract them and, and feed on them. During the summer months, they prim primarily feed on insects. And another shot of an acorn woodpecker. So this is a, a fresh acorn that he's going to 
put in one of the holes um, that was probably pre-drilled. And what's interesting is as the acorns age, you know, they turn brown and they shrink. And so the acorn woodpeckers are quite fastidious and careful. And so they'll move when, a, when an acorn becomes loose in the hole, it'll move it to a tighter hole. So it's a nice tight fit. And I assume it keeps them from falling out, but also, uh, you know, it makes it harder for squirrels and such to, to steal the seeds or to steal the acorns. And it's also a favorite food of the California scrub jay. Um, but jays, uh, instead of storing in a tree, they bury them underground. Uh, so it's fun to watch them dig a hole. Uh, in my backyard, I saw one one day bury, bury an acorn. And then when it was all finished, he found a, a dead leaf from our persimmon tree. And he put it on top where he had done it to try to camouflage where he had dug the hole. It's pretty cute. And another time I saw, I saw one dig up an acorn and put it on a rock and he chiseled it a little bit, um, ate part of it, and then he buried it maybe 10 feet away in a different spot um, than he dug it up from. But these birds have, you know, fantastic memories and, you know, they, they can bury thousands, thousands of acorns uh, in the fall and find all of them. And uh, here's another California scrub jay. This guy's got two acorns in his mouth. Another acorn eating bird is the varied thrush. Another is the Lewis's woodpecker. And the final one that I have here is band-tailed pigeon. Now this, this bird is a little different than the others, where the others will break open the acorn and eat the inner, inner seed or meat of the acorn. Um, Band-tailed pigeon just swallows it whole. And uh, its digestive tract can, can handle it and break it down. Now, we saw the red-breasted sapsucker earlier on the persimmon, but the, generally the way they feed is uh, by drilling wells in the tree, so a bunch of holes. Um, and then they then they come back, they they wait for the sap to seep out and they'll feed on that sap. Or if they're lucky, some insects will be feeding on the sap and get stuck and they'll eat those insects as well. Now, now before we leave the gathering of the food gathering section, a, a little a few shots of birds drinking. So this is the Arizona desert. And uh, in the morning, the birds would come to these flowers on the saguaro tree, saguaro cactus, and uh, they drink up, apparently drink up the, uh, the dew that had gathered overnight. And this is a Gila woodpecker doing the same early morning. And here you can see that he's covered in pollen. So this is the other pollinator that I mentioned earlier besides uh, besides the verdant and the hummingbird. Uh, I don't, I think it's rather rare um, that you'll see uh, that you'll see woodpeckers as pollinators, but this is one case where I was able to, to capture that. And then uh, a few years later in the same area, I found a Gila woodpecker, but uh, because of the drought, the the cactus didn't flower, at least not at that time. Um, so the woodpeckers were just probing inside the cactus itself um, and extracting liquid. They were just doing that yeah, constantly. Another drinking bird is this lovely yellowed collared macaw. This was uh, taken in Brazil. And also from Brazil is a sloppy drinker, a javaru. Okay, now we'll look at some birds hunting and we're gonna start small. So uh, this is not a hunting shot. This is just an overview of a, a female Lasley bunting that I was watching carrying nest material. And then every once in a while it would stop and it would pick at the branch. And then I got a close up and I could see uh, she was picking off aphids. 
sort of the beauty of photography where you can zoom in and, and see what's going on, which you normally can't see with your naked eye. And then recently, this uh, the black-throated blue warbler that showed up uh, on Redwood Shores, I think it was. Um, and uh, you, here he's got a, an aphid in his mouth. Now, these birds also go after larger prey, but uh, like I said, we're gonna start small, so we're gonna show the small stuff. Uh, and here's the Wilson's fowl rope. Um, generally, you know, they sit on the water and they kind of spin around. Um, and this causes a bit of a, a, an upwelling of the water below them. And so aquatic insects rise to the surface. So usually they just kind of sit up there and kind of stab at the, at the uh, insects as they, as they find them on the surface. But this guy, for some reason, he lunged out of the water at, at this tiny, tiny insect. Uh, I'm sure he expended more calories than he consumed. And here's the Lewis's woodpecker. We saw it with uh, an acorn before. Now here it is going after an insect. Um, and uh, again, it's a lot of effort for a tiny little insect. Um, another insect eating bird, it eats, uh, uh, eats other things, but uh, it uh, largely eats mites and other insects off of large mammals. Uh, this obviously is taken in Africa. And this lovely bird is a Western tanager uh, with a not so lovely prey. Got a nice ant in its mouth, in its beak. And uh, a dwarf cuckoo from Colombia with a beautiful uh, caterpillar. And a very common bird around here, American avocet. Um, and uh, it sweeps its bill across the water, uh, finding uh, some more aquatic insects. And here's a young avocet. Um, I'm, I don't remember how old it was, but it's probably, I'm guessing maybe three weeks old, but it had the technique down really well. And these birds, as you probably know, they can feed themselves practically right out as soon as they hatch. Um, I think within an hour or so, they can walk and they can fend for themselves, basically. Um, I mean, the parents still protect them, but uh, they're feeding on their own. The parents don't feed them. And the roseate spoonbill feeds in a similar fashion. Uh, it takes that lovely spoonbill and uh, it sweeps it across the water, just as the avocet does. And, uh, and again, it stirs up, uh, stirs up uh, various uh, um, you know, food sources, you know, um, insects and crustaceans and other things um, that it can feel with its bill and close and, and swallow it. Now, this is a cute little shot of a canvas back. Uh, as you can probably figure out it dives, uh, dives for its food. And so it rummages around in the mud. And this is what it looks like when it comes up. Uh, without covered in mud, it has this beautiful bronze, bronze feathers on its head. And the black oyster catcher, which is well-named uh, for his favorite food source. And here it is with a mussel and sitting on a, you know, a veritable feast that he could feed on for probably years. Uh, and then this is another oyster catcher, an American oyster catcher which is found on the East coast of the US um, as well as other areas. But um, um, this one is, uh, you know, plunging its bill into the sand. So they're not just, uh, um, they don't just eat mussels and other large mollusks. Yeah, I'll look at a couple snail eating birds. This is a snail kite and uh, it's diving or lunging or whatever you call it. It's going to grab a, a snail in just a moment in the marsh below. And here he is, you can see in his left talon, he's got a snail. And that, that, uh, that deeply hooked bill is perfect for extracting the snail from the, from the shell. And 
Another bird that primarily eats snails is the limpkin. Uh, again, found uh, this was taken in Florida. Uh, and it's almost exclusively eats, eats snails. And here he is, kind of a busy photo, but you can see him extracting or attempting to extract the, the meat from the shell. Okay, now some real hunters. This is a Merlin. And uh, yeah, they basically, uh, well, they feed on birds. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate. And this guy, he was, he was perched on maybe not this, I think he was perched on this branch. Um, and he was just looking below and then I saw him swoop down and just kind of glide right at uh, ground level. And he picked off a sparrow that was just, you know, just a couple inches off the ground. And he flew back to this branch and I was able to watch him feast on this poor little song sparrow. A Merlin, by the way, is a type of falcon. And here he is plucking it. And I'll spare you the, the rest of the photos. And here's a barn owl in the middle of its dive, uh, looking for some prey, some, you know, some small rodent. Uh, I mean, I've seen and photographed barn owls dive zillions of times, but they always disappear into the grass. Um, and for some reason, I never see them come up with any anything. I, I see them in flight with prey, but whenever I'm photographing them in a, in a shot like this, I never see them come up with prey, unfortunately. Now, this is a white-tailed kite. Um, I'm sure you've all, well, most of you have seen it before. You know, it has that the way it, uh, way it hunts is that it hovers. Um, so this, this bird is hovering right now and it's looking below for, for prey. And it uses its uh, special ultraviolet vision um, to look for, for urine trails uh, for the rodents down below. And so it gets an idea, it has a good idea when it spots those urine trails, which reflect ultraviolet light, um, they can find a good hunting ground that way. And here's a kite diving. And here's a kite after a successful hunt. And he's got a little vole curled up there. And uh, after, I mean, I was, I was waiting for him to start eating it, but uh, I think he just got a little too nervous with me watching him with my big lens. And so he flew off, but he gave me a view of this poor little vole. Uh, who only had a little while left to live. Uh, back in Florida, he's a great blue heron, very common bird. And I saw him catch this, uh, what was it called? I think it's called a, I think it was a green water snake. Um, but anyhow, he caught this snake and you know, it looked like he was pretty happy. He started walking off with it. And then the snake wrapped itself around him and it's wrapped around his neck, and I probably should have showed another photo, but it's wrapped tightly around his neck here as well as his head. And it was a bit of a standoff, like a deadlock. Um, the snake, you know, couldn't let go because um, it was, you know, it had to threaten the bird. And the heron didn't want to let go of the, the snake's head for fear of getting bitten. And I think I looked at the photos a while um, when I first took it, I think it was three minutes. They just sat there, <laughs> right? No, no one was making a move. Uh, but finally, after three minutes, the heron just whipped his head forward and, uh, and shook the snake loose and then just, you know, pecked it to death. Um, and this is uh, the final result. Okay. Uh, another great blue heron. This is in Florida because you're not going to find that prey uh, out here on the West Coast. Uh, and when I got this photo, I mean, I had no idea what that animal was. And I was walking around with my camera, showing it to some of the locals, you know, to, to look at that picture. And no one knew what it was. But I finally found someone who thought they knew what it was. And it's a, in fact, it's a, it's a greater siren, S-I-R-E-N. Um, yeah, it's a crazy bird. And I couldn't watch them eat it because I was at a park that was closing at, uh, at dusk. And this was after or around sunset or after sunset already. So, uh, so I had to leave, 
but I don't know. I don't know if he actually conceived it. Um, a couple of years later, uh, when I was in Florida in the, the same general area, and who knows, maybe the same, the same heron, but I saw one catch another siren and he severely injured it. I'm sure it died, but, he, but the heron seemed to just uh, go on without eating it. So I don't know what that's all about. And uh, this is uh, from a springtime trip to, to Arizona this year. Uh, I was delighted to get a shot of a, a, a greater roadrunner out in the open. But when he, when he climbed up there, I was uh, yeah, super excited to see that he had some prey. And here's some type of lizard he's got in his beak. Okay, now we're gonna look at some birds feeding young. So these are uh, some Western bluebirds. And this is a nest that had two openings. Uh, actually, it wasn't until later that I, after they fledged, that I discovered that there are actually five, five young birds in there. Uh, but the parents were keeping busy feeding them regularly. And uh, after the birds fledged, um, you know, the three of them, or excuse me, the five of them would gather up um, I only have a picture of three of them here. The other two are on another branch, a little farther away. Um, and just wait there together for a parent to come and feed them like this. And here's a beautiful woodpecker called the Williamson sap sapsucker. Uh, and you can see his bill is filled with food, so insects and ants. Um, and that's the nest hole. It's a fresh nest hole that he just dug this year, obviously. Uh, and uh, he will have some chicks in there that he goes in to feed. And here's a Nuttles woodpecker feeling, feeding a young bird. And uh, let's see, we're back in Brazil. This is a crimson crested woodpecker bringing food to the nest. Looks like a large insect larva. and a very similar looking pileated woodpecker feeding a young bird. And another thank you to Vivek Kanzade for, uh, for telling me about this bird and actually driving me there. And here's a, a parent uh, burrowing owl feeding its young. And uh, a cliff swallow, that's the parent on top, bringing some food to the young bird. Uh, and a yellow-headed blackbird is the female uh, with a huge mouthful of, of insects that, that it's, insects that it's gonna bring to the nest. A lot of these birds, you'd never have to get to see the nest. Um, in this case, they're, the nest is hidden in some marshes, you know, at ground level. Uh, but whenever there's a mouthful of food like this, you know, you know that there's a nest nearby. In fact, generally, if you see a bird with an insect that's not eating it, it's about to bring it to a nest, at least if it's the right time of year. Um, this is an ash-throated flycatcher. Um, there's a nest in, in the tree uh, that this branch is connected to. Um, again, I never saw the nest. The nest was on the other side of the tree, which is a, basically a hole in the tree, a nest cavity. Um, but it was on the wrong side of the tree and getting to the other side would have disturbed the birds. So I only shot the, the, the parents bringing food to the nest and they pause before they go inside. So anyhow, so I, the, uh, the bird, I mean, the, yeah, the birds take about, I think, 17 days uh, before they fledge. And so I went there just about every day. And at the beginning, the parents would bring small prey like this. Um, but after a couple of weeks, uh, the chicks would graduate to eating much larger prey, like this dragonfly or this lovely butterfly. Again, this butterfly is, a, I believe it's a California sister. And by the way, this is uh, 
This is the same bird that was in the title page uh, when he first started, the one that said bird food. And the common gallinule, uh, parent feeding is the young chick, which is not the prettiest, the chick's not the prettiest bird in the world, but it's kind of cute still. And uh, this uh, Western, Western grebe, parent feeding one of its chicks. And uh, these little birds, they'll swallow, they'll swallow that fish whole, although it does take some effort. Whoops. Okay, I need to thank Vivek again for inviting me on a trip to Clear Lake uh, to go out on a boat to, to shoot some grebes. Uh, so this is a Clark's grebe family. Uh, it's a bit of a busy photo, but uh, you can see there's two parents. One, one parent on the left is feeding a fish to the young bird on the right. And there's another young one just peeking his head out. He's riding on the back of, of a parent and he's peeking his head out. Uh, salivating, I guess. And uh, yeah, here's here's a Western grebe feeding feeding a, a young bird a feather, and feathers are an important part of the diet for you know for chicks as well as adults, uh, as it aids in digestion. And here's a peregrine falcon, um, and He's got well some prey. Okay, the falcons they they pretty much just eat birds. Uh, they catch them on the fly on the wing, um, so they'll dive at you know very high speeds and uh, and just grab the bird or stun it. Um, and uh, this one it caught I don't know it's probably a dove. It looks like it's partially eaten, um, and he's carrying it to a nest, which is uh, which you can't see in this photo. Um, it's also really interesting to note um, that, um, I don't know if the pointer works, but this little pouch right here, um, that bulge, um, that's, uh, that's the bird's crop. And so a lot of raptors and, uh, have a crop, uh, so it allows them to eat lots, lots of food and be able to fly off with it um, and digest it later. And so it's obvious this peregrine falcon had, had consumed you know, some of this prey or some other prey uh, uh, recently. Now, I apologize for the quality of this photo. It was a, it was a foggy day taken very far away, but it's, it demonstrates how, how peregrine falcons will feed their young. Um, so that's an adult above, and the adult bird, the adult peregrine falcon had caught what looks like a starling, and and the uh, the young bird comes up, and uh, the the adult drops the bird into the uh, into the talons of the young bird. So it's uh, it's quite fun to see that, uh, and I hope to get a better shot of it someday in the future, in the near future. And so here's here's that young bird that just caught the starling, um, and he flew to a spot that was a little closer to me, and so I was able to to get a better a better photo of it. And I hope you can see the starling in its, in its right talon. And Northern Harriers do the same thing. They feed their young the same way. Um, so I know the scale is kind of confusing, but that's an adult Northern Harrier above, and that's a, a young, <laughs> A young bird below, um, and so the parent, you know, dropped this little bunny rabbit, and the uh, the young harrier is coming to to catch it. Now we're going to look at uh, a behavior called interspecific feeding, and this is a uh, it's a very rare uh, behavior. How rare it is, it's not quite. Clear. Well, yeah, we'll talk about it later. Um, but first, I'll just show you what it is. So, uh, I encountered these uh, this mountain bluebird nest uh, in the Sierra, and uh, went in the saw it in the afternoon, late in the afternoon. I saw these three little chicks, uh, and what's going on here? Uh, 
And yeah, uh, so I, it was almost dark. So I went back a few days later to photograph it uh, in the morning when the light was better. And so here's, here's the male adult uh, coming in. And that's the, you can see one young bird with its mouth open. And uh, here's the mother with what looks like a grasshopper and two, two chicks vying for the, for the tasty morsel. But as I was watching, I saw this pygmy nuthatch come in. Uh, and it not only came near the nest, but these chicks, which were larger than the pygmy nuthatch, uh, were being fed by this, the, uh, the bluebirds were being fed by the nuthatch. And so this is the same nest um, that the bluebird parents were feeding it. So these young bluebirds had two different species feeding it. Um, and generally, I mean, generally birds won't feed other species and generally the chicks won't respond to other birds that stick their head in, in the nest. Um, but in fact, the, the nuthatch was, the, the nuthatch or nuthatches, I couldn't tell how many there were because there were several, I think they were, I think I spotted three, at least three separate nuthatches in the area, um, in the immediate area. Um, but they were feeding the, the mountain bluebirds more than the mountain bluebird parents were. It was pretty amazing. Here's another shot. Here you can see the size difference. Um, and so, I mean, not only was a pygmy nuthatch feeding the birds, but it would stick his head inside and grab the fecal sac, which is basically the, uh, the feces, uh, and carry it off and basically uh, perform some nest cleaning. Um, so the mother bird, the mother bluebird seemed happy with this, uh, you know, happy with having have this, uh, this helper around. Uh, occasionally the male bluebird would do what it thought its job and protect the nest and chase off the nuthatch, but the nuthatch uh, would not be deterred. It would just wait and then go back and, and feed, feed these young bluebirds. Now, a couple of years later, I found similar, uh, uh, interspecific feed instance of interspecific feeding. Um, and this was instead of a bluebird and a and a pygmy nut hatch, it was a Williams and sapsucker and a red breasted nut hatch. So Williams and sapsucker is a woodpecker, and the nut hatch is similar to the uh, to the pygmy nut hatch, uh, but it's a different species, red breasted nut hatch. So I'm not sure how this is going to work for you. Uh, well, you're not going to have any sound because it's coming through my microphone, but uh, you'll be able to see it. So that's that's a young Williamson sapsucker, and it's begging. It's going. Uh, he does that when he knows the mother's coming, and then he ducks back in when the mother comes, or when someone comes with food. And here's the female, the mother Williamson sapsucker. This is the biological parent, and then. A minute or two later, you know, the sapsucker is begging. And who comes? Who comes? But a red-breasted nuthatch to feed it. And again, the nuthatches were feeding these birds more than the biological parent. In fact, I never saw the male sapsucker. Um, and the red-breasted nuthatches were coming in constantly. Again. It, it was probably more than one red-breasted nuthatch that was feeding these birds. Uh, and I know there are at least two sapsuckers in there, but I can't tell because I know there was one, I saw one male and one female, but there could have been multiple ones. It's hard to tell because you only see one at a time. Okay, so yeah, so we'll talk about this a little bit because it's pretty, I find it very interesting. Um, so finding birds that are feeding other species is not too uncommon. Um, for example, there's a, a pattern of feeding called brood para, para, parasitism. Um, and that's behavior where um, a parasite, a mother, a mother bird of one species we call the parasite will lay eggs inside the nest 
of another bird. Um, and that's the host bird. And so the parasite, the the that lays that 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 puts the egg inside the host nest never participates in raising its young. It just drops the egg and leaves and leaves it to the host to do to raise the chick. And the host bird is oftentimes larger than the than the other birds uh, in the nest in the host nest site and uh, and will win out and maybe even maybe even kill those little those other little birds. But it's uh, it's pretty interesting that happens because sometimes uh, the parasite chick, when it fledge when it fledges, is larger than the than the host mother. Um, but you know it raises the young and it just keeps feeding it. Um, and that's it's the uh, the <clears throat> uh, let's see the cowbird is probably the, the best example of this uh, this behavior. And then there's the notion of uh, cooperative or communal feeding. Um, and this is characterized um, by several species like uh, acorn woodpeckers, but also, um, not surprisingly, nuthatches. Um, so nuthatches, oftentimes the, the first year adults, you know, um, instead of, you know, uh, finding a mate and building a nest and uh, having their own chicks, they'll help their parents raise the, the next year's round of, of young birds. Um, and so they're considered helpers. Um, and yeah, nut hatches are known to be this, ty this type of uh, cooperative or communal uh, feeding birds. Um, and so helpers are very common there. Um, uh, but the helpers generally are helping their parents. Um, they're not helping different species. So we know it's not brood parasitism and we know it's not pure, you know, a helper relationship as in cooperative or communal, communal feeding. But the fact that we saw nut hatches in both cases with uh, the two examples I showed you before, um, leads me to believe that uh, these were helpers um, uh, that were, uh, that decided to help the bluebird or the or the woodpecker, and in fact, in both cases, there was a nuthatch nest in the same tree. There was a cavity in the same tree, and so I saw saw the nuthatches going into you know helping, you know helping the other bird, um, but also going into the nest and um, maybe bringing food, you know, to their own chicks, or maybe just uh, maybe bringing food to the parent, or maybe building the nest. I don't know what they're doing. They're going in and out of the nest. Um, and it was much higher up in the tree. Um, but I, I'm guessing or assuming that it was uh, a case of helpers who basically got confused. Um, the, probably the hormones were flowing. They have this you know, huge drive to, to help and to feed other birds. And with a nest nearby, the hormones were up and they heard birds chirping and begging and they just had a need to go and feed them. So. Anyhow, that's interspecific feeding. Uh, so one case of synchronized feeding uh, is with white pelicans. It's pretty interesting to watch them. Um, I mean, they'll sometimes feed on their own, but a lot of times they'll gather up like this in a row. Um, and they'll, they feed on fish, by the way. So they'll drive, they'll, they'll come up and form a little semicircle and basically corral the fish. Um, into a concentrated area, and then all of a sudden they'll just uh, plunge their beaks into the water and and uh, and uh, eat all the fish that had gathered there. And then when that's done, they'll form up a formation again and, uh, and do it over again. Now I only have one example of a bird playing with its food. Uh, not surprisingly, um, this is a a young red-tailed hawk that was. Uh, about to catch a vole and it caught it, but instead of flying off with it or eating it, it's, we toss it in the air. Hopefully you can see it there on the right side. And here the vole is falling to the ground and he tossed it up several times. Uh, don't know why I call it play, but who knows? Um, he eventually flew off with it and I guess eventually ate it. And just a couple of shots of scavengers. 
Um, so this is a peregrine falcon on the left, uh, you know, who had caught a gull and he was trying to eat it. Um, but more and more vultures kept coming in. There's actually some on the other side of them um, and more were arriving all the time. Uh, and he was getting more and more nervous. Uh, he was looking up more than he was eating. So eventually he just, he just flew off. And here's a prize that one of the turkey vultures got. Okay, fishing. This is a, I don't know, just a shot I like of a great blue heron with a fish. And another, not, nothing special here, but it's just a shot that I like of a great egret. Um, and yeah, you can see he had, he just plunged into the water for a fish. And if you look really carefully, right over here, you can see a tiny little fish in his beak. Um, so just a quick little plunge, pull up a little fish, but sometimes it's, it's more of a yank and they'll come up with a giant fish. And it's pretty amazing. You know, these birds are willing to eat these tiny, tiny little specks of a fish. Um, but other times they all eat something that's orders of magnitude larger. So I, I don't imagine it has to eat for what, you know, it'll swallow this fish whole. Um, and I don't imagine it needs to, to eat for quite a while after that. Uh, and another fish eating bird is this Forrester's turn. Um, they tend to, they, they dive into the water for food, uh, for fish. And here's one that just came out of the water and you can see the fish, but if you look really carefully, you'd see the fish was, had, you know, he pulled it out of the water, but now it's falling out of his beak. Um, it's actually not in his beak. And so I was shooting 10 frames a second. Um, and so it was either the next frame or the one after, um, he recovered really quick. Uh, and then maybe a 10th of a second later, boom, he was able to grab that fish and fly off with it and eat it. Now that was a mistake, but these birds are very, adept, sort of our turns in general are very adept at tossing, tossing fish, because here's an elegant turn which toss the fish intentionally. Um, and they do that because when they catch the fish, you know, it might just be by the tail or by the middle of the bird, the middle of the fish, um, but to eat it, they or to swallow it, they need to position the fish head first, um, pointing down their throat. And so they'll toss it until they get it in the right position. And terns are not, uh, not the only bird that does that. Um, this hooded merganser caught a stickleback and you know, he thrashed it around a bit, um, basically to kill it. Um, and then he had to toss it around a little bit to get it perfectly positioned. And this is the perfect position for swallowing a fish. But the expert tosser though is double crested cormorant. Uh, as you can see here, he really, he really threw that thing way up in the air. But sometimes it's pretty much impossible to toss the prey into the air. Um, but the cormorant still has to maneuver this, so it's head first. Um, but you know, through basically brute strength, it uh, grabs the fish and has to tilt its head straight up um, and let, he let gravity uh, help force it down the throat. So black skimmer, we're very lucky to have this bird that shows up every year now. Um, it, the Bay Area didn't used to include its range, um, but uh, I guess in the mid nineties started showing up here. So it was very exciting um, when it first started showing up and now it's, uh, it's a reliable bird we can find um, at the, you know, in large numbers because it nests here at a couple of places. Um, in the, along the, well, this is, uh, this is along the Bay, the south, the south end of the Bay. San Francisco Bay. And so this is how they feed. Um, they skim, yeah, they're called the skimmer. They skim across the top of the water, um, dragging their lower mandible. And uh, they just feel for fish. And when they feel a fish, 
They snap it up. You can see it, it's in the bill right there. And they've got it. And then they'll, they'll either swallow it uh, as they're flying or carry it back to a nest for some young, to feed some young birds. Now here's one, another series where you can see he went after the, after the fish, the bill snapped shut by the big, flat, by the big splash, you, you can see that, uh, but the fish actually got away. So to live another day. And here's another attempt at fish. Uh, he kept catching a fish and it came up with two. Um, and I don't think this is planned. <laughs> I think the, uh, I think I read that uh, the skimmers just fly basically blind. They can't see what's in the water and they just feel for, for a fish and then snap it up. And if they find one, great. If they find two, even better. Whoops. And yeah, so maybe the master of holding food in its beak is uh, the puffin. This is an Atlantic puffin uh, photographed in uh, Eastern, let's see, where did I take this? Oh, this was in Iceland. So they'll dive down underwater to catch fish and they'll come up with, you know, well over a dozen. And they'll carry this, they'll carry these fish into a burrow where they have one chick waiting. Uh, and it's a real feast for that one chick. And here's a close up of one of the birds uh, before it goes down into the burrow where it has its nest. And I believe those fish are called sand eels. And uh, here's a great tailed grackle with a uh, frog. So just a note here, um, I know I've got a lot of a lot of photos of birds with food, but I don't even know what's going to happen. Like I was just photographing this grackle. Um, you know, he was posing and sitting on a rock and, you know, calling and stuff. Um, but, you know, sometimes they just, you know, surprise you. Um, and it's just uh, fortuitous and they come up with something like this. Uh, Again, you uh, just you know being the right place at the right time. Um, this this lake is huge. Um, I don't know; it's maybe a mile long and a half mile across. And you know, I was just on the shore, um, and the odds that this osprey would dive into the water, you know, practically right in front of me and come up with a fish is just you know pure luck. Um, and that's, that's the nature of bird photography. Uh, a lot of waiting uh, and uh, occasional, uh, you, you, strike, you strike it lucky. So this is a, uh, I forgot how to pronounce it, um, a black crappie, uh, that's the fish. I think it's, maybe it's pronounced crappie. Um, anyhow, so this is a, uh, the bird is an osprey. I know that and I know how to pronounce it. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, it's a fish eating bird, and it uh, it flies above the water looking for fish down below. And when it sees one, it just dives, uh, dives in and grabs it, just plucks it out of the water. Um, this bird is very common in Florida, so um, you know there getting shots of osprey are pretty easy, um, and getting them with prey, but uh, yeah, it's less. Less common here, so I consider myself very lucky to have uh, have have had this guy perform right in front of me. Um, this African fish eagle, it uh, it fishes in the same way uh, as our bald eagle, and uh, there's a fish in front of him, just just about to grab. And a brown pelican, um, <clears throat> this is an immature bird, and uh, it's just starting to dive. Uh, as it plunges into the water, and then it uh, it opens its mouth as it enters the water, fills up its big pouch with with water, and hopefully with uh, several fish. This is a reddish egret. We're back in Florida, and it feeds in a different fashion than most egrets and herons. 
Um, so what it's doing here, it runs across the water, or I should say prances across the water. Um, and very, you know, kind of scaring up all of the birds, all of, excuse me, all of the fish, um, which is going after. Um, but then it stops and it throws its wings out like that and creates a little bit of shade. And apparently that shade attracts the fish uh, for maybe a little a safe spot where they can uh, escape the, the reddish egret. And then the, the egret will just, you know, stab down into the water and grab it. And this is called canopy feeding because it creates that canopy with its wings. And that's the, the prize. And yeah, here's a lovely green kingfisher with a not so lovely fish. Let's see, this was taken in Belize. So, okay, I've got a, a somewhat gruesome tale to tell you here with a series of photos. Um, so this is a lovely hooded merganser with uh, crayfish, crawdad, crawfish, whatever you want to call it. And so he just plucked it out of the water. Um, you can see uh, this one in front, he's got one pincer here and then another pincer on the other side, um, uh, holding onto a twig, which isn't going to do him much good now, but uh, that's all he could do is grasp at something to keep from being carried off. Uh, so, so the hooded merganser, you know, it's equipped to swallow its prey whole, like we saw it, saw it uh, have with that stickleback, that little fish earlier. Um, but they're fond of eating crayfish, but swallowing it whole is a little problematic at this stage um, because of those pincers. And then it's got eight legs here as well. So it has to remove all those appendages. And that's what we're going to watch. So at this stage, you know, you can see he's got the left, the left claw or the left pincer in his mouth. Um, and the right, as, when this was taken, the right one's already gone. Um, but uh, so he's just starting to, you know, you can see all the bubbles there. It's kind of, a, you know, kind of a violent uh, scenario. And here he is, you know, he's got it. He's got that, uh, that left claw and he's shaking the bird and shaking it more and more. And here you can see the pincer is starting to break free. And there it's falling off. So now the crayfish doesn't have any claws, um, but he's still got those legs, which are problematic. Now, here he is shaking, the, shaking that poor crayfish again um, by its legs. There's a couple legs that have flown off over here. A couple more legs that have flown off there. I'm sorry if this is too, too graphic for you. Uh, and then when it's all cleaned up, he'll swallow it. Okay, enough of that. Uh, but still, more, <laughs> more, more birds eating other animals. So here's the western gull with a small starfish or sea star, and uh, they can swallow these whole. This is a small one, but uh, I've seen pictures of them eating giant ones or full-sized uh, sea stars. Uh, here's a gull that's uh, that wants to eat a mussel, and they don't have the ability to you know, to open it up. And so they carry it into the air and drop it onto a hard surface. And they might have to do it several times, but eventually it'll crack open if they hit a hard rock uh, or something like that. And then once it's, once it's cracked like this one, uh, they can extract the, the meat. But the surf scooter, doesn't have to break it open. Um, its bill obviously is not equipped for that, but uh, it just swallows the, the clam hole and uh, it can break it down in its gizzard. Um, it will consume rocks to help uh, break it down um, inside its digestive system, but uh, it's pretty amazing that they can digest, digest something like that. Uh, 
now we look at courtship feeding. Um, and so, you know, part of the courtship ritual for many birds is to feed your feed its mate. Um, and usually it's the male that brings food to the female. In this case, uh, we have some Trinidad Motbots taken in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and here it is feeding a centipede to its partner. And so Western grebes and Clark's grebes, which we saw earlier uh, feeding chicks, uh, they have a very elaborate courtship display, which we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about the whole thing here, but part of that, a small part of their courtship display is, uh, is feeding a partner. Now kites are well known uh, as feeding, feeding their partner as part of courtship. So here's a white-tailed kite, um, which we saw earlier. It was diving and it caught the vole, if you recall. So here he is, you can see there's a vole hanging down from its talon. And so he just, he was waiting there for his partner. And then she came in and here she is, she's on our right. Um, She's taking it from him right now and he's about to let go with his talon. And now she has it and she's happy and he's happy. And this uh, solidifies their bond. Uh, but what's more interesting about white-tailed kites when they do their food exchange uh, or their, court, you know, their courtship feeding um, is when they do it in midair. And so here's the male bird that caught a vole the female's flying up behind it um, and she grabs it in midair. And in this case, she has a rather un unorthodox technique where she flies upside down beneath them and grabs it, but whatever it works. Now, look at a few cases of thievery, birds stealing food from other birds. Now, th this is a thievery prevention technique. Uh, hawks will often uh, perform what's called mantling, where they hold their wings out like that. So this red-tailed hawk, actually it's the one we saw earlier, um, but he's got a vole. And so he spreads his wings to try and keep other birds away and protect his prey. Um, and again, uh, theft protection. Um, this berganser caught a crayfish, um, but there's other birds that are trying to steal it from him right now. So he dashes off as fast as he can uh, to try and eat it on his own. Same thing with this double-crested cormorant. He caught this fish and he's, he's in hot pursuit by some other cormorants and maybe a white pelican, I don't recall. Um, so he, he just tries to swallow it as fast as he can. And luckily he's got it head first already. Um, so he'll be able to swallow this pretty quick. And here's a forester's turn that tried to steal a fish from another forester's turn, but uh, the lucky one was the fish. You can see it up above. The fish got away to live another day. Again, this is more like theft prevention. Um, this forester's turn caught a fish uh, in what the great egret thought was its territory. So it's basically a, just a warning shot saying, keep away. Yeah, the turns for some reason, they're, they're the target uh, of thieves quite often. So here's a, here's a Caspi turn that's uh, in pursuit by a Western gull. And here it's being chased or another one, another one being chased by Harriman's gull. And this is the same day, but uh, different species of gull were going after it. And here's the Herman's gull trying to grab that little fish. He's very close to it right now, but he wasn't quite able to get it. And sometimes the turn will just, you know, it's in, this one's in pursuit and it just doesn't want to deal with it. And so maybe there, I don't remember, there might've been several several goals after it, which often was the case. So he might, might decide to give up and just drop the fish. Now this next series of photos, uh, they're not very high quality, but they're kind of interesting. So this is a short-eared owl and it's got a vole in its talons. 
And here comes a Northern Harrier. It's got an eye, it's got an eye on the vole, not on the owl. And so he wants to steal that vole. And the owl's holding it really close. And you can see he's reaching the talons up right where he's holding the vole. And here, the next shot, um, you can see the, the vole is you know, right here and the talons are there. So it looks like he's not quite on target. Um, and in fact, he got away. Here, here the owl is getting away with the, with the vole, but it was a close call. Now, the next few shots, at least the final shots of the evening, um, were taken by Ken Finisi. Um, I was with him at the time, but uh, Ken came away with better photos. And so he was kind enough to share them with us. So uh, here's a peregrine falcon, which we saw earlier. And you know, it's an extremely good hunter. Um, and it, it eats almost exclusively other birds. Um, because it can dive at a couple hundred miles an hour and just stun, stun another bird and just uh, you know kill it midair. Um, but this guy was kind of lazy, um, so he was sat up here waiting for opportunities. And his opportunity, I should mention that there were a lot of white-tailed kites in the area that were catching voles. And so the opportunity was when a when a kite caught a vole, it would just fly in really fast and steal it. And here he is, and that's a, that's a sequence, one, a sequence of several shots. And this peregrine falcon, I watched it over two days, and I mean, it would do it, I don't know, a couple times an hour. Um, I don't remember exactly how often, but uh, he was pretty successful. I saw at least once, a couple times, he'd go after a, a, a kite that had a, it dove after prey, it came up unsuccessful and the kite would go out, the peregrine falcon would go after it and of course would come up empty. Um, another time the kite just dropped the vole, didn't want to deal with it. And so, uh, and so the peregrine falcon didn't get it either because it, it didn't want to go down to the ground to fetch it. But anyhow, this is a, it's, as far as we could tell, it was a, this behavior in these two species is, has never been documented. Um, and in fact, Ken and I had an article published um, in the Journal for Western Field Ornithologists um, with Ken's photos and, uh, and some input from me. And that's the end. So uh, if any of you are wow. left, we'll take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is spectacular, Steve. I mean, I, I have no words. Okay. Um, so, so Sreed, um, the interaction with the, uh, with the owl, owl and the, uh, and the harrier, you were with me that day. Um, I don't know if you got the shots as well. It happened super fast and neither no, of us, I neither of us, neither yeah. of us knew what was happening at the time. Um, <laughs> it's only when I got home and looked at the photos that I saw what was going on, but anyhow, no, I, I, I got blurry shots that day and absolutely nothing. Uh, but yeah, this is spectacular. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I awesome. think, uh, you know, some amazing comments already. Um, yeah, please feel free to use the, the chat box or if you have a question, uh, I have so many, but yeah, please you know, feel free. Uh, Myra says, I learned a lot, thank you. Edith says, fascinating. Uh, Shravan actually wrote earlier saying this is the first shot I ever saw from you, Steve. A great one. And Vivek says again, amazing work. Some very yeah, super super nice comments as well. Leah says amazing photos. Thank you for thank you so much. Yeah, these are these are stunning. Um, I I I do have um, lots of questions about settings and things like that, but. I don't want to get too technical into the uh, into each camera settings and everything, but Steve, do you have a, a preference preferred mode that you typically shoot with? You're on manual uh, shutter speed, anything like that? Um, and the first, I guess, the first uh, 
well, until recently, I usually photographed in, uh, in aperture priority. Uh, I would always you know, shoot, you now at office at the beginning, you know, shooting perch birds. And that was just my comfort level. Um, and then after a couple of years, I started shooting more in manual mode if the conditions were right. You know, if the light was the same, it was the light was consistent and I was going after the same bird that had the same, uh, you know, if it was a white bird or whatever, um, and I could just set it. And so I would do that. Um, and then when I went to um, uh, mirrorless, when I could actually see pretty much what the exposure looked like in the viewfinder. So now I'm exclusive, I now exclusively shoot manual. Perfect. And, and the storytelling too, you already said uh, something about a, an article. And I, I wonder if you actually reached out for any publish, publish, publishing company about the nut has behavior. This is what I'll, I mean, um, so interesting to see. Yeah, I, I had, I had that published in, uh, yeah, in the same journal, uh, the journal for the Western field ornithologist, which is a rather small publication. Um, and, and that was sort of a more scientific kind of article. Yeah, um, yeah. but I had a more armchair birder type of article in, uh, it was a birder's digest. I think it was, um, I put a couple of photos, but it was more, it was written more for the layman. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, and those, oh, those were both, though. those were both with the nut hatch and the bluebird. Uh, yeah, Shravan also says uh, great shots, especially like the nut hatch bluebird behavior and the peregrine kite behavior. It's great to see your and Kent's photos. So. Okay, thank you, Shravan. Yeah, this is yeah, spectacular. I, 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 this is amazing, Steve. In so many photos, but um, but what lovely stories. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No one wants to know what gear I shoot with or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's hungry. That, everybody's that, hungry that's always this. that's always a question. <laughs> okay. Guessing you use the R five a bunch because the way you're catching these. I'm sorry. What was that? I was guessing that your R five is having a big effect on this. Oh yeah. Um, since I started, I mean, most of these are from older photos. You know, over the last 14 years, I started shooting in 2008. Um, but yeah, the world has changed uh, since I went mirrorless um, because of the autofocus. And uh, I mean, I can shoot. I shoot with a with a six hundred and a one point four teleconverter most of the, almost all the time, and and I shoot handheld now. Um, when I never could do that before because the autofocus can grab the bird. I can be kind of sloppy uh, in my technique and still come out with a sharp shot. Um, whether the bird is flying or even perched. Um, and then focus is a lot easier. You don't have to guess and check. Um, yeah, it's opened up a whole new world. There, we got a gear question. Thank you, Obi. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's not the gear, unfortunately. It's the photographer. Well, the gear has helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, I don't know if we have any questions, yeah. but let me just say, let me say hi to Nancy from Iowa. Hi, Nancy. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hello. Very interesting. Yeah, beautiful okay. story, actually, Steve. I'm, I'm really sure, um, uh, I'm recording the, the session as, as always, and I'm, I'm actually going to circulate this because we have a few people who are not in the call, and I think they missed such a great, great presentation today. Okay. Well, it's been my pleasure. And I thank, want to thank all of you for joining me and let me, letting me share my photos with you. Yeah. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Now you set coming. the bar so high for Louis and, uh, and Vivek next month. So well, I've, let's see. I've, I, I, I've got a preview of Vivek's photos. Um, and they okay. are amazing. Amazing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. so there's, there's no problem there. And, uh, Luis also from his trip to Patagonia, all these species that I've never seen before. Um, uh, yeah, so no problem there. So Bob has a quick comment actually, um, saying, thank you, Steve. Great photos. My best of show is the Trinidad Mott Mots. The second place is the hooded Merganser and the crayfish sequence. Okay. Best of show. I, I, 
I recognize that phrase. That must have been Bob Bokelheide. Thank you, Bob. That, that, that's right. <laughs> And uh, okay. Lena, Lena says presentation was stunning. So, okay, thank you, Lena. Thank you, Vivek. fantastic. So, next next month is actually Louis, uh, and then the the following oh. month is Vivek, and we oh, okay. we actually have an open month in April because I I really want to explore a chance of doing the bring your own photos one more time, but with a specific topic. So I'll send a reminder out in February. I mean, I'll send a reminder out soon, uh, and then people can shoot. Uh, birds in spring, like a, you know, most of March and maybe early May, uh, sorry, early April, and then uh, hopefully do a bring your own, sh bring your own photo show to to the April session one more time. It was very popular. Lots of people asked for a repeat. I think that that will work out. And then in May we actually have Jerry Ting and who's going to be uh, giving us the final talk. So we have very good sequence of speakers. Thank you for starting us off, Steve. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Sri. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. okay, good night, everyone. Good night. Good Thank night. Thank you.